Assalamu alaikum students. This is Shahzeh Rahman and I welcome you to the Green Valley Digital Classes. Dear students, today we are going to discuss the most famous and influential theory of personality which is known as the psychoanalytic theory of personality. Psychoanalytic theory of personality was developed by Sigmund Freud, a famous figure in the history of psychology. Psychoanalysis is different from other schools of psychology because it was developed in a medical and clinical tradition, whereas other schools of psychology like structuralism, Functionalism, behaviorism were developed in the academic setting and the founder of these schools considered themselves as academic psychologists because they are having their association with universities and various laboratory works done in those universities. There are 22 theoretical orientations regarding human mental development in psychoanalysis. Freud's concepts and ideas were voluminous in nature and here it is quite impossible to deal with his ideas and concepts in detail. Freud used the term psychoanalysis in three senses. First, it was a method of treating mentally ill people. Second, it was a theory of personality. And third, it was a school or system of psychology. Psychoanalysis is a specific mind investigation technique and a therapy inspired from this investigation. The term psychoanalysis is the combination of two words. The first word is psycho which means mind and the second word is analysis which means to analyze. Therefore, the literal meaning of the term psychoanalysis is to analyze each and everything that exists in the mind of a person. These are some important points about psychoanalysis. Now, we will discuss some points about Freud's personal life. Because there exists a connection between Freud's personal life and his work. It will help you to understand his works later. Freud was born in the little town of Freiburg, Austria on May 6, 1856. Freud belonged to a poor family. His father, Jacob, was a poor wool merchant. When Freud was four years old, his family moved to Vienna, where he remained for nearly eight years. In 1938, the Nazi invasion forced him to go to the London. He remained in London until his death on September 23, 1939. In 1923, a cancer was detected in Freud's mouth and it was said that this cancer was connected to Freud's atypical habit of smoking 20 cigars per day. He underwent about 32 operations and bore almost constant pain for the remaining 16 years of life. In 1933, Hitler came to power and due to getting various types of ill treatment, most of the German psychoanalysts moved to America. 
In 1933, the Nazis burned the books of Freud in Berlin. But in Berlin, it was through the active cooperation of Ernest Jones and William Buehler that Freud was allowed to leave Vienna for London. In London, Freud was well received, and soon he was made a member of Royal Society. as newton and darwin had been before him finally freud died in peace and honor on september 23 1939 with an apprehension that his four sisters left in austria might have been killed by the nazis as a young man Freud decided to make a name for himself as a medical researcher but due to some reasons he was not able to do that After receiving his medical degree he entered private practice and it was during this time that he formulated his theory of human personality and psychological disorders Freud's mother Emily was his father's third wife and Freud was the eldest of seven children Emily was 20 years younger than her husband in fact she was only 21 when Freud was born Freud was the first born and that's why he always remained his mother's favorite Freud's father Jacob had also two grown sons from previous marriage and Freud later reported that he was often jealous when his step brothers who were much older than him was flirted with his young mother on the basis of above points we can say that freud was very much close to his mother but his relationship with his father was cold and distant it is because of this he even arrived late at his father's funeral and missed most of the services At the age of 26, Freud married Martha, and the marriage was a successful one and produced six children, one of whom, Anna Freud, became later a famous psychoanalyst. This was all about Freud's personal life. Now we will discuss. the freud's theory of personality after receiving his md degree in 1881 he also became acquainted with joseph brewer who was using hypnosis in the treatment of hysteria joseph brewer was an eminent physician of vienna and 14 years older than freud in 1895 both freud and brewer jointly authored and published the famous paper studies in hysteria this year is important because this marked the beginning of psychoanalysis as a system in fact This paper contained the germ for psychoanalysis. In 1885, Freud won a research grant to study in Paris under a French physician, Jean Martin Charcot, who was then using hypnosis to treat the patients of hysteria. Before we proceed. I will give you some information about hysteria. Hysteria is a condition 
in which individuals experience physical symptoms such as blindness, deafness or paralysis of arms or legs for which there seems to be no underlying physical cause. The cause is purely psychological in nature. Freud later replaced it hypnosis with his new technique of free association. It was out of these experiences Freud gradually developed his theories of human personality and mental illness. Now we will discuss the structure of personality according to psychoanalytic theory of Freud. Freud divided the structure of personality into two aspects. One is the dynamic aspect and the another is the topographical aspect. The dynamic aspect of personality consists of three components. One is it. The second component is ego. And the third component of dynamic aspect is the super ego. The topographical aspect of personality is also divided into three parts. The first part is conscious. The second part is preconscious. And the third part is unconscious. We will discuss all these components in detail. By the dynamic aspect of personality, Freud means the agent through which conflicts arising in the instincts are worked out. And the first component of the dynamic aspect is it. it refers to the biological element of personality because it is the original source of personality which is present in the newborn infant at the time of birth. It is from the it that the ego and superego develop later. It consists of all our primitive innate urges, which include various bodily needs, <coughs> sexual desire, and aggressive impulses. It is closely linked to the biological processes and provides the energy source libido for the operation of all three systems. Increases in energy level produce uncomfortable tension for it. And the id seeks immediately to reduce this tension and return the organism to its normal state. Thus, it seeks immediate gratification of primitive pleasure-seeking impulses. Big impulses are unorganized and obey no rules and no laws. They are free from all inhibitions. It acts like a spoiled child because it wants immediate gratification of its wishes and desires. It is totally unconscious and has no direct contact with reality. Therefore, it is not changed by the experiences of person 
or by the passage of time. It operates on pleasure principle. It avoids pain and obtain pleasure regardless of any external considerations. It is illogical in nature because it poses demands and wants to satisfy them without considering the external conditions. As per Freud, it employs two mechanisms for reducing tension. One is reflex action and the another is primary process. In reflex action, the id responds to the sources of tension automatically and thus immediately removes the tension. Cuffing, blinking and sneezing are some of the examples. Primary process refers to a process in which person reduces tension by developing a mental image of an object that is previously associated with satisfaction of basic drives. In this process, the person does not distinguish between real and unreal. An infant is purely guided by such primary processes in reducing tension. According to Freud, dreams and hallucination of psychotic individuals represent wish fulfillment. The second component of dynamic aspect is ego. Mental images do not satisfy needs. The starving man cannot reduce his hunger by eating visual images. For that matter, reality must be considered. And this is the role of the ego. Ego develops out of it because of the necessity for dealing with the real world. Ego is that portion of the psyche which is in the contact with the outside world on the one hand and the it on the other. Ego takes into account external conditions and the consequences of various actions and accordingly directs the behavior so as to maximize pleasure and minimize pain. Ego acts as a policeman to check the unlawful activities of the id. The ego's task is to hold the id impulses in check until conditions allow for satisfaction of its impulses. Ego operates on reality principle which requires it to test reality and delay the tension until the appropriate environmental conditions arise. Ego takes the real world into consideration. The ego is essentially the executive of the personality because it decides what actions are appropriate which it instincts will be satisfied and in what man. The ego mediates between the demands of the id, the demands of the world and the demands of the superego. Ego is logical in nature because it deals with the environmental conditions. It differentiates between subjective experiences and the nature of things in the external environment because it obeys the reality principle. Ego sleeps but 
maintains a dream censorship. Ego is the real self because it represents conscious intelligence, follows reality principle and is in constant touch with both ego and superego. Ego acts as a mediator to resolve the conflicts between it desires and moral principles and is in touch with time, space and physical reality. Ego operates by secondary process which includes thinking which is realistic in nature. In it, ego develops plans and strategies about how to achieve satisfaction. Ego serves two functions. First, it reduces anxiety by preventing threatening impulses from coming into consciousness by means of defense mechanisms. And second, it tries to maintain communication between the id and the outside world. The third part of the personality is super ego. Super ego is the internalized representation of the values and morals of society as taught to the child by the parents and others. Super ego is the moral commander of the personality. Super ego grows out of the ego and like ego it has no energy of its own. As we know that the it seeks pleasure, ego tests reality and the super ego strives for perfection. It is guided by the idealistic principles. Super ego is regarded as a decision making body because it is the task of the super ego to judge whether an action is right or wrong according to the standards of society. Super ego strives for perfection. It permits us to gratify such impulses only when it is morally correct to do so, not simply because when it is safe or feasible as required by the ego. Super ego differs from the ego in the sense that it has no contact with world of reality and therefore it is unrealistic if it is demands for perfection. Super ego develops in response to parental rewards and punishments. Freud divided super ego into two subsystems. One is conscience and the another is the ego idea. Conscience includes all the things and actions the child is punished for doing, whereas the ego ideal includes those actions and behaviors the child is rewarded for doing. As the child grows into an adult, the conscience punishes him by making the person feel guilty and the ego ideal rewards by making the individual feel proud of himself. Initially, it is the duty of the parents to control the child's behavior directly through rewards and punishments. But it is through the incorporation of parental standards into the superego that behavior is brought under self-control. The child no longer needs anyone to tell him it's, it's wrong to steal. His superego tells him what is right and what's wrong. Super ego performs many important functions. 
like they inhabit the impulses of it particularly those society inhabits such as sex and aggression it persuades the ego to substitute the moralistic goals for realistic ones and the third which i already told you people is that it prepares the ego to strive for perfection for it also made it clear that the divisions between these three provinces of mind were not sharp and defined the development of three divisions varies widely in different persons in some individuals the super ego may dominate whereas in some individuals the id may dominate in a normal healthy individual all these three provinces namely the id the ego and the super ego are well integrated and work in harmony with every one in a normal person the three work as a team producing integrated behavior whereas in mal adjusted personalities these three provinces of the mind do not work in cooperation conflict between the id ego and super ego may occur at conscious for conscious and unconscious levels of the psyche fight refers to the conscious the poor conscious and the unconscious as the topographical aspect of the self the first component of topographical aspect is conscious conscious consists of those mental elements that are in awareness at any given moment it refers to the immediate awareness because this segment of mind is concerned with the immediate awareness it includes everything of which we are fully aware at a given moment it includes our current thoughts whatever we are thinking about or experiencing at a given moment according to freud only a small portion of mental life is in consciousness the second component of topographical aspect is preconscious which is also known as subconscious or foreconscious the conscious contains memories that are not part of current thought but can readily be brought to mind when we need them either spontaneously or with little effort in other words we can say that preconscious is that segment of the mind which is immediately accessible where one can trace his memory or thoughts and it is for these reasons that preconscious is also called available memory the content of preconscious comes from two sources first source is conscious perception and the second source is the unconscious in conscious perception what a person perceives remains in consciousness for a temporary period of time and subsequently when our attention shifts to something else it quickly goes into preconscious the second source is the unconscious some ideas come to consciousness from unconscious via preconscious state in distorted forms such as dreams slip of pen slip of tongue etc such ideas 
quite easily slip out of consciousness, they are said to be in consciousness. It is because of these reasons that in Freudian psychoanalytic system, preconscious thus acts as a bridge between conscious and unconscious. Now we will discuss the last and the most important component of the topographical aspect which is the unconscious. Unconscious consists of thoughts, desires, wishes, impulses of which we remain largely unaware. And according to Freud, these wishes, desires, impulses were once conscious but has been actively repressed because it was too painful and anxiety provoking. Unconscious ideas mostly relate to childhood experiences and sexual desires as well as conflicts. It is a storehouse of several unsatisfied desires, cravings and urges which influence our behavior. It was this unconscious portion of the mind that Freud sought to explore and he did so by the method of free association. Unconscious vision cannot be readily reached by the person. And for Freud, unconscious impulses play a very important role in shaping our behavior. Unconscious ideas enter into consciousness in a distorted form. In order to avoid the sensor guarding the passage from the unconscious to the preconscious. And Freud said that unconscious ideas are the only explanation for meaning behind psychopathology of everyday life, dreams and various types of forgetting called repressions. So it is for these reasons that we cannot study a human being by observing his overt behavior because most of the repressed ideas, thoughts and feelings remain in unconscious and continually influence our behavior. So after analyzing the Freud's theory of personality, we can conclude that dynamic personality structure according to Freud is made up of three major systems that is age, ego and super ego. Each of these systems has its own characteristics and mechanisms but their important feature is that they interact with one another and the human behavior is the outcome of such an interaction. There also exists a connection between the levels of awareness, conscious, preconscious and unconscious and the three systems, it, ego and superego. The id is said to be belong to the unconscious. It represents all of the psychic energy that motivates behavior and is available at birth. The ego receives its energy from the id, but it is partly conscious. It is forward as an individual develops. The superego is roughly the same as the conscience in the sense that it contains all of the teachings of the per person's family and culture regarding ethics, morals, and values about how one should behave. So this was all about the psychoanalytic theory of personality developed by Sigmund Freud. Dear students, hope you will understand it very well. Thank you. Have a nice day.
ठिकाणी